This city has this amazing background with art in the streets. Uh, I was always talking about Chicago like the house of my grandparents. And, and I was with this amazing responsibility on my shoulders when I got that commission. Uh, Picasso, Miro, Chagall, Oldenburg, everybody's in the streets of Chicago. Welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the William and Stephanie Sick Distinguished Professorship Lecture. Bill and Stephanie Sick, who become dear friends since I've been here, uh, sitting here in the first row, established this Distinguished Professorship Program in 2007. The program brings unique perspectives to the school's design program and cultivates collaborations that go well beyond the classroom. In 2007 and 8 and 8 and 9, Bruce Mao was the inaugural recipient of this award. We're pleased to announce that Jaume Plenza has accepted this honor and position with SIIC for the coming academic year with a course entitled Public Light and Space, Public Art Projects for the 21st Century, co-taught with John Manning and Jan Tichy. Doing such a thing as this is completely in keeping with the goals of the School of the Art Institute, which is to be impactful in the city of Chicago and to take what we know, that artists know, out into the public realm. Of course, uh, Jean May is most known in this town for the extraordinary Crown Fountain, uh, which for me brings together at least three, but I'll list only the three that are extremely meaningful to me, one who's been very close to the issue of public art and the public realm. First of all, this is a difficult and contested space, anything dealing with public art, both literally and figuratively, and clearly this is a much beloved monument in the city. Two, uh, if you look at how Jaume achieves his work, he brings to bear ancient sources and contemporary technologies on a project that in this case is unique and absolutely appropriate to its Chicago setting. And lastly, uh, situating the body, light, sound, memory, and humor, human interaction into a current circumstance which seems to favor the virtual or ephemeral is of course a hallmark of Jaume's work. And when I mentioned this is a homecoming of sorts, there are many people uh, in the audience here who worked on the fountain. I'd like to mention just a few because they're also close friends of the school. Uh, many members of the U.S. Equities team who were part of this project are here tonight. Uh, my good friend Bob Winslow, who I know shares a passion for public art in the civic realm, as well as Rourke Frankel and Alan Shackman, who are sitting here in front and meeting with Jean May again. Uh, Jack Guthman, who I had the pleasure of having dinner with last night, who made sure that Jean May was on a list of artists to be considered. Uh, Paul Gray, who's worked with Jean May throughout the process of building this fountain and also other works in the United States and beyond, and his father, Richard Gray, uh, who supports uh, Jean May's work in their gallery. And Alan Lab and John Manning, two of the best faculty at the school who were instrumental in making sure that the technology behind this work actually functions. And it's very brave if you think about bringing technology of this kind and sensitivity into the public realm. But thanks to our faculty, that was made possible. And of course, the Crown family. Uh, if, if you understand the contributions of the Crown family along the entire journey of the building of this fountain, and especially Steve Crown, who's the head of our building and grounds committee here at the Art Institute, as well as the head of the committee dealing with facilities at the school, we are in very good hands. But the way that that family, and Steve in particular, took hold of that project is a testament to what it means to be a Chicagoan. Now, I'm not going to go into Jaume's lengthy biography. He's uh, the holder of many awards. His work is found in most of the prestigious museums in this country, in Europe, and Asia. I would note that he does have what I'm sure will be an extraordinary exhibition at the National, uh, excuse me, the Nasher Sculpture Center in Dallas next year. Uh, he's working on numerous projects, some of which involve uh, sets for the stage and for opera, which I hope we hear about tonight, given that our school is dedicated to interdisciplinary work. He is a Knight of the Order of Arts and Letters, as bestowed by the Minister of Arts and Culture in France. He's won the National Award for Plastic Arts by the government of Catalonia, Catalonia, where his hometown of Barcelona is located. But maybe most importantly to us, he received an honorary doctorate from this school in 2005. Um, these lectures and others in this series of the Sick Professorship will be taped and published later for wider distribution so that all of you, some of you are here tonight and those who are not, will be able to benefit by what you hear. 
But without further ado, I'd like to introduce my good friend now, Jaume Plenza. Thank you, Duke. Uh, well, I, I met a lot of friends before the, the lecture, and, uh, and they know so well my work that there's a little shame to explain again my work. But first, I would love to thank Mr. and Ms. Sek for this, to make everything much easier, to be in this new period, uh, to be professor. I was a very bad student. I hope I could be a better professor. And, uh, in any case, uh, obviously, when I got the invitation of that lecture and I saw the images of the Crown Fountain reproduced there, I, th I decided to start my lecture talking about the Crown Fountain. I know it's just nearby, right in the corner with Monroe, but I guess it, it's quite beautiful if we can talk or just to think a little bit more about it. Uh, well, uh, a public commission, well, that is the main reason of my uh, seminar with the students in the, in the School of the Art Institute. Uh, it's not only uh, to build up something in the space, it's not the idea of to do a big piece in outdoor. A public, public space has a, a certain rules, some laws that you have to follow. What means public space means people. That, me, that is the, the main idea. And, and even when I was doing my first sketches, my first idea for the Crown Fountain, people was always in the, my drawings because the, the, main, the main idea was to try to create an emptiness in the city, a place, a gathering place where people could meet and enjoy. Well, then technicians develop, uh, well, my ideas into something more, uh, let's say, technological, but that was the site uh, in my first visit almost, because we, we, we create a mock-up with a scaffolding just to understand the, the, how tall the piece was, because in that moment many people were concerned about the size of the piece, and, and with Paul Gray, with Susan Crown, Jim Crown, Paula Crown, with uh, uh, several uh, uh, members of the Crown family and the team, we visit the site, and, and it's hard sometimes to imagine that that was where the Crown Fountain is today. But uh, that was a little bit, uh, a very quick uh, evolution of the body of the piece. Uh, I don't know if you remember every time when I was uh, presenting my project, I was always talking about a project composed by a body and a soul. And, and, and uh, Mark Sexton and Alan Shatman, Rock Frankel, many of those people was taking care with me about the body and the School of the Art Institute, John Manning, Alan Lapp, was taking care about the soul. And that was a little bit the evolution of the piece. In that, that, that was the, the gargoyle that we developed in Toronto, which was a, a very interesting experience to try to understand the way that the faces could just put the water out without any danger for kids. All the, all the light systems inside. You probably remember the piece of Mar Chagall, that you have in the city, and it's a mosaic with small tails, and it's funny to how how similar the, the little dots of light are with the piece of Chagall as well. And uh, here is myself trying to to be sure that the the glass structure was strong enough. And uh, and I remember with with Mark Sexton in the, his backyard in the studio, we were trying also to realize the 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 interaction of the glass blocks with the LED screens behind. And that was several uh, samples that we did in, in his studio. And, and at that moment, well, the piece you remember, it was the time where people start to enjoy. But all those faces are coming from the School of the Art Institute, and that is the homage today for them. And uh, you know very well the piece. But that piece was uh, starting in that little office that we create in the school. You can see John Manning and Alan Lapp, and I guess this girl was Maria, that she was taking care about all the, all the people who was accepting to be filmed for the fountain. This man in the picture, I think, is sitting over there. And, 
and he was so passionate. It was one of the first to accept to be filmed. And, and, and mainly we, we filmed the faces and, and it was a kind of post-production trying to fit the face in, in the shape of the tower. Uh, since the beginning, when I, I did my proposal for the fountain, the faces had exactly that shape. It was uh, cut it nearby the eyes. The mouths of all the faces were in the same place, the eyes in the same place. Because my intention was not exactly to do portraits of people, but uh, the, the soul, to try to catch the soul of that people inside the towers. I remember that I was talking at that time about transparent houses inhabited by people. And, uh, and, and that was the, 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 the samples that we did in the school to try to understand the, the shapes. You see, I guess it's the... You see, it's very similar, one and then the real one. And then the, the gargoyle position. As you know, we have two different clips, one for winter, which has not that position, and one for summer when water is working. And that is the position with the real water going up. Well, but the main reason of that piece, which uh, I guess is, well, a, a gift for me, is the response of people, I guess. Uh, well, I'm not sure if a piece like that in another city was so successful as in Chicago, because this city has this amazing background with art in the streets. Uh, I was always talking about Chicago like the house of my grandparents, and, and I was with this am amazing responsibility on my shoulders when I get that commission. Uh, Picasso, Miró, Chagall, Oldenburg, everybody's in the streets of Chicago. Probably that gave a certain open mind to all the people in this city to understand the risk of a piece like that in the public space, because as you pro can imagine, it's a quite hard maintenance, a piece like that. I'm sorry. And, uh, but well, the piece, it's beautiful, but that was the, the most beautiful gift for me. Uh, normally, uh, as an artist, you never think about kids. I don't know, I have children, but I'm always, uh, what are you doing with this? But, but you think that your work is not really directed to them. Uh, you feel that you are an intellectual and you are in another level. And, uh, and certainly uh, with Rock, uh, one day we, we decided to take the fence out and to check what could happen with the piece. And, and, and our surprise was that suddenly uh, the piece sucks a lot of people in and mainly kids. And uh, I still remember that the day after, all parents were complaining against me that all the kids were completely wet. And uh, but, uh, they decided to, to, to play the role with me. And uh, this possibility really to feel the humidity directly, not as before in the, the mostly part of fountains in the world, the, the position of the, the, the visitor is just static, you see the water doing fantastic things, but you are not part of that. I guess in my work, the main interest is to invite people to interact with. And uh, something so fundamental as water in our life is the 60% of our body is water. That means that let's walk on the water, let's enjoy the feeling of humidity. And that is really a gift when you see the kids really enjoying. And, uh, and the faces are also an homage to this kind of uh, anonymous people which are building up a city, but mainly it's an excuse uh, uh, to, to create an open space in between. Uh, when two persons are talking in a conversation, I don't know, I'm always fascinated about the space that they create in between, the, the, the space in between two persons talking. And that is the idea with the fountain that opens a certain space where inviting to people to come in. And kids understood immediately. And, and this idea that everybody is welcoming in, in, the, in the fountain, it, I guess, is, is fantastic. OK. Uh, but obviously, I, I had a president life before the Crown Fountain. And I hope I could continue with something else. I, 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 I would love to, to, to show some of the projects before and after, and, uh, 
to show you that even if my nature is very diverse, many times when I read uh, uh, in the newspapers uh, an article about my work, or about my exhibitions, many times people say, it looks like a, a group show. It's because my nature is very diverse. I always understood the, the idea of an artist as a diamond, plenty of facets, and when the light is touching from one side to another, the, the stone, the diamond looks something different. That means a human being is never the same. We, we are experiences every day something different that make us, I guess, a little bit different. But probably even if in the shape I'm different, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, similar in my ideas. Uh, I guess my material are not exactly uh, metal, glass, uh, LED screens or water, my, my main material are ideas, and I guess it's, it's a fantastic material uh, to develop and, and, and enjoy. For example, that was one family of my work that I was doing, that is 1991, and which, which was the idea to create bridges, uh, but vertical bridges connecting the sky and the earth. Well, if I really follow the, the words of William Blake to, to, to link the heaven and hell, which is the sky and the earth. And, and, and that project was in, in France, and, and that one in, in Jerusalem. And uh, uh, this idea that uh, we, we can really uh, create pieces that appear and disappear, uh, pieces that help us to imagine something physical instead that uh, to have the physical element in front of us. And this kind of bridges of light, well, you know, architects love bridges. They, they want to do a bridge always. But they do always the horizontal bridges, which is, I guess is a completely boring and mistake. I mean, the, the important bridges are the bridges which connect our dreams and our reality. And uh, that bridge of light was in the north of England, at the Baltic Center, which is a museum in England. Uh, in, Gage, in Gage Hit. That, that was the last uh, work with a light beam, which is in, in the roof of the BBC Broadcasting House in London. And, and well, you can see, is a, a glass piece where I engraved a, a text talking about silence. Well, you know, the people who which is working in the broadcasting uh, radio, it's, well, they know very well words, but that, I imagine, they control even better silence. And that was the homage of silence. And, and every evening at 9.30, when they start the, the news, the, the, my uh, light beam starts to work for one hour in the sky of London. That is West, well, all the, all the Westminster sky. Well, all those light pieces are also related with my cells. Probably the Crown Fountain is coming directly, the body of the Crown Fountain from that period, that is in Japan. It's places where I invite people to sit and enjoy, that is in Daikaniyama. And, uh, and, and that area, which is very magic in the evening, becomes a very uh, well-known place for lovers just to sit and enjoy my benches. And uh, because it's a quite silent and darkness place and where people could talk. That was in Chatsworth, also the same idea with alabaster cells in my show in Hanover a long, long time ago, in 98. In, in each of those cells, it was the sound of my blood stream working. Uh, I invite many times parents to take their kids to the hospital and to, to, well, to feel the sound of their own body. The, the, the blood is not only something uh, terrible and negative, blood is the, the, the liquid that uh, fits our body. And, and it has a beautiful sound. And uh, I recommend everybody to really go to the doctor or to the hospital to really listen the sound of their blood. That, that, that was a piece that it was quite key for my Ground Fountain project because some of the advisors for the project saw that piece at the Jeux de Pomme in Paris and they recommend my work uh, to the city for, for that project. Uh, finally, it was a room uh, of red light, and when you walk in, it was completely covered by light. That was, well, like the Grand Fountain with water. The idea of duality, like in the Grand Fountain, that is part of the Dasher collection. I'm sorry. 
And that is when I'm starting also to work with leathers and the, the shape of bodies. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about it later, but it's one of my obsessions, as you know, in my work, the, the, the concept of alphabet, the concept of leather, wars, etc. That, that, that piece was probably one of the first in that, in that family. I also been working for many years this kind of curtains, also with poetry. Uh, well, I love poets. I love poetry. I guess that was my source of inspiration since always. Uh, more than uh, a visual culture, I have a more uh, a, a text culture. I remember my father was somebody very interested about books and text, also music. Uh, he was playing piano, and I remember I was so small at that time that I had the capacity to hide myself inside his piano. And uh, I probably remember the vibration uh, of, the, of this instrument when he was playing, uh, and he didn't know that I was inside. But uh, he was always insisting to make me read uh, books that I don't like it, I didn't like it. But I, I remember the text. I, I don't remember the content, but the text. And uh, probably one day I decided to use that text as material. Uh, and and, and I, I use all my poets, I don't know, Shakespeare, Blake, Baudelaire, uh, 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 Goethe, uh, many of, of them, uh, I, William Carlos Williams, uh, uh, Allen Ginsberg. Uh, I have a certain group of poets that really helped me to grow up and many times I said that they are the legs of my table. It's where I really develop my personality. And, and the idea of curtains, you probably had something similar a long time ago in the States. I remember in my Mediterranean culture, all the stores had a kind of curtain, metallic curtain. And I remember when I was a child with my mother to go to, to the stores, and I loved it to play with the curtains <clears throat> that they avoid, that flies went in. But Thinking about poetry, finally poetry is also a curtain which protects us. And uh, many times you have to take the decision just to, to pass through. And when you take that decision, I think everything changes. The world is different, the life is beautiful, everything is fantastic. Uh, I, I like that shot because somebody is penetrating through, is passing through. And in many ways it's very similar, like in the Crown Fountain, when people is taking the decision, to walk in the pool. It's a very th thin line between the dry and the wet area, the, where the, the reflecting pool, and, 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 and when you uh, decided to uh, become part of the piece, or you prefer to keep us as a spectator. And in the, in the, in the curtains, is a very similar thing. I, I'm asking the, the people to take that decision. You can read the text in vertical, and that is many installations that I did around the world. But more or less, it's always this concept that was in Chicago in the Arts Club. And, uh, and that is another of my families of words, which I'm asking also that people take the decision. It's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working with uh, TAMS, this uh, instrument that uh, orchestras also has, and they use very few times in one year, but, uh, and that is my self-portrait sitting in front, just looking at the group of 18 times, uh, where I inscribe it, I uh, engrave it on the, on the, on the surface, uh, texts from Song of Songs. You probably know that beautiful text, probably one of the most erotic, sensual, beautiful poems that never write nobody in the world. And, uh, and, and People take the decision to, to beat the gong. Uh, that work is completely related with my love for William Blake. You probably know his poetry. And William Blake uh, says, one thought feels immensity. The idea that the vibration of our bodies, the vibration of materials, are filling up the space. We don't need really to fill up the space only with physical elements, but with our energy, with the energy of the objects. And, and, and that is, uh, I guess, an homage to that concept, because when you beat the gong, 
the, the gong is vibrating and expanding all around this kind of beautiful sound. And uh, at the moment that you are engraving uh, a text, you are eating metal uh, and, and you are changing the sound of that instrument. That means that the, the words has this, the, the, the function to really uh, transform the material to the way that this sound is filling up the space. Well, uh, that, that was uh, this group of pieces, but related completely with another one. I did my first piece in 97, 1997, and it's the opposite. In, in the gongs, the people are taking the decision to start here. It's like a metronome. It's a drop of water falling f down from the ceiling, beating the cymbals. That means it's the nature, it's, it's, it's the rim, the, the, the eternity. And also with poetry from William Blake, the Proverbs of Hell, etched on each symbol. And, and, and well, it's a work in progress. And uh, I started with one uh, in, in, in different museums. I'm growing up with my pieces. The last installation that I did, it was 44. And I'm pretending one day to find the right space to finish my installation, which is 30, uh, 73. Uh, which all the proverbs of hell. But, uh, well, I'm working, look at, it was 98, and we are in 2009. I don't know, well, I'm waiting to find the right space. And uh, now I'm finishing also that project in Dubai, which is an installation with symbols and drop of water. It, it, that, that, that project is for the main entrance for the Burj Dubai, this very tall building, apparently the tallest building in the world is about 800 meters tall. And, uh, and they asked me to do the, the, the main entrance. Uh, well, you see the building, uh, the, the, the entrance is over here, is this kind of little lot. And, uh, and I'm working in two little pools, one in each side with all the the, the rods coming up with the symbols is about 196 symbols uh, representing the, the countries in the world. Every symbol is one country. I, I like this idea that uh, in their culture it's not possible the representation of the human body. That means I, I took the concept of symbol representing, uh, well, people. Finally, all the symbols for me are people then. And, uh, and the drops of water are beating those symbols in a very gentle way, and when people pass through, they will listen the sound. Well, that is a certain mock-up because the piece is not installed yet. Everything is in Dubai, but it's not ready. And that was the mock-up that I did uh, in my studio to understand the piece. That, that is the virtual representation how the piece will look in the, in the side. Okay, uh, that is a, another part of my work, which is in the landscape with the ephemeral pieces that was made with snow. It was a collaboration with Norman Foster in the Alps, Italian Alps. And, and uh, I did something that I'm working quite often, which is to try to, to do a picture of the landscape th uh, uh, using the, the GPS numbers, which are probably like a beautiful poem and very precise. It, I guess it's a mistake of four meters or something like that, but it's quite precise. And, and, and here you can see the, the geographic position of the Norman's, Norman Foster studio, my studio in Barcelona, and the site in, in Sestiere in Italy. In the evening was really beautiful. And uh, it was a piece that, I don't know, it was melting one week later. And, uh, but I guess it was a really beautiful experience. That was a piece that we did in Aspen, but uh, with, with marmol. And that, that was also one of the, the pieces that uh, was quite influent uh, for the Crown Fountain that I did in Germany, in Potsdam. And uh, it was this kind of figures for one year traveling all around Brandenburg, the, the region of Brandenburg. And it was quite interesting. Let me see, I, I guess it's a laser. Well, I don't know. In any case, you can see in the, in the arms, it's low speakers with the sound of my bloodstream. In the chest is a camera filming the landscape in front. And in the knees, it's also sensors that recognize the movement of people in front. 
And when somebody was passing in front, the piece starts to work. It was awaking, that was the piece. And, and it was permanently in internet, and uh, everybody knew where the piece was and the landscape that the piece was filming. And uh, that was probably a very clear link with the Crown Fountain. Uh, for me, it's 90, uh, no, for 2000. Well, I started the project at the Crown Fountain at 2000. Well, it was at that time. And, uh, and it was very interesting every time I've been in, in Berlin at that time that you found people like this guy talking with the figure or, I don't know, in conversation with, which is not far from the Crown Fountain, and that, that idea of conversation duality. Okay, that it's a similar piece in Paris, uh, looking to buildings. Or other of those figures just, they're fixed on the, on the walls, this kind of big human beings like fat angels that they could not fly and they are fixed on the walls looking to us from above. That it's a kind of poetical view from me, from our, our imperfection as human beings, which I guess it's also our quality. And uh, all, those, all those big figures has text, uh, uh, you know, are always coming out from the wall. Texts from Song of Songs or from psychiatric concepts. You see always this idea of three in that case. And also, these similar figures also sitting in the top of poles. They are very tall, about 10 meters tall poles with the figure sitting and changing colors as well. Uh, that is in Jacksonville in Florida. And we did a kind of conversation with several. And it's my idea about this kind of conversation between different cultures. Uh, that project called it Talking Continents was my dream that one day maybe we, we, we can talk without any uh, aggressivity between different cultures. And in that case, uh, instead to use words, I use colors. Because as you know, colors has also uh, a meaning. And, uh, and it's beautiful to, to contemplate this kind of conversations because, well, when somebody is blue, one, it's boom, already green. And then suddenly it's white. And the other, when everybody agrees and it's white, well, one is yellow. OK, that is humanity. And, uh, and that was a similar project in Nice uh, uh, that I did with seven figures, also changing colors permanently. Again, a similar work, which is my self-portrait embracing trees. As you know, in the al al alchemic period uh, in the Middle Age, alchemists were dreaming about the capacity of materials to be transformed. Uh, they said from the dead body a new life is coming out and, uh, and the, it's like a tree, they said, and the roots are in the, in the earth, in the dead material, the trunk is coming out and the branches are embracing the cosmos and they, they, they call this tree the, uh, well, uh, something like the, uh, the tree of the knowledge. This idea that the tree represents this uh, capacity of human beings to transform everything into something new. And, and, and well, I love it always, this concept, but I like to, to link that concept with the relationship between body and soul again. Well, I'm convinced that our body uh, finally gets fixed in one measure, unfortunately, but our soul continues to grow up. And I'm always asking myself where the soul is going because it, the soul, our soul has not any more space in our body. And, and, uh, and the, the, in that case, the tree is representing for me the soul. And uh, it continues to grow up because it's something alive. Instead that my body is blocked into a, a permanent material like bronze in that case. And uh, for example, in that project in Germany, which the piece is, is a permanent installation, I suppose that the tree will continue to grow up and one day they will lead my face, they will overflow my body and, and that is when the piece will be fantastic. And uh, obviously kids love my work again and, uh, and has this beautiful relationship with. That is in, in Japan, in Niigata, uh, my portrait looking at to the landscape with the trees as well. 
Well, that is this uh, new uh, uh, family that I decided also to develop deeper, which the body is built up with letters. Something as simple as it seems even stupid to use letters like cells. But uh, when you are thinking more about it, it, it's really poetical. And I guess it's a beautiful metaphor about our society. One letter alone seems nothing. But it has an extraordinary personality. But one letter together with another has the capacity to compose words, words with words, text, text with text, culture, etc., etc., etc. It's this beautiful concept from the smaller to the greatest, no? The, 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 the little stone around the stone, the temple, around the temple, the city, around the city, the country, around the country, etc., 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 the universe. And uh, I, I found very comfortable that uh, for my background to use letters in the beginning was just my own uh, alphabet but slowly and slowly I, I just mixing with other uh, different alphabet well you probably remember that was an installation that I did in France that and uh, this kind of big big pieces that people could penetrate and, and, and the body becomes a house becomes like a construction uh, that was in Miami, the same piece. That piece called Nomad was traveling all over. It was uh, like a homeless project without a site. And, uh, and that is a, well, a very romantic attitude if you, if you go on, because when people are inside the piece, they see the world through art, through my piece. And it seems that everything is possible. That is in the mines where the piece finally find a home. And that was in, in Grand Rapids. That was in England, and, uh, in Chatsworth, in Moscow. That, that it's a similar piece, but you can see it's already mixed with, it with different alphabets. That is in Prague. And, uh, and that it's, uh, well, that the, the new, uh, things that I'm developing deeper and deeper. Uh, I'm mixing in that case uh, eight or nine alphabets, and uh, and it's very interesting to see how how well it, they are working together. I mean, uh, everyone with their own personality, together with the other, it works so well. And uh, I guess it's a beautiful metaphor that we can be together, and uh, and it's not a problem. That that is one of the pieces that I'm preparing for my show at Nasher. Sculptor Center in Dallas, end of January. This idea of twins again, the conversation between two figures. And you can see probably better here the, the mix of different languages, alphabets, sorry. And uh, I'm using uh, Hebrew, Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, uh, Korean, uh, Greek, Hindi, uh, Russian, and Latin. Nine, nine alphabets. You see, well, uh, one of my dreams is to try to invite people to, to come inside. You probably know that one of the ideal things in love is to invite the other to go inside yourself. And I remember a long, long time ago, a Japanese student had uh, his girlfriend to, to go f uh, to the end of this idea of love. Well, in my work, I don't need to eat nobody, but uh, I am in trying to invite people to come in my work. And uh, in those pieces, you can see that uh, finally I have the capacity to do that little building that will be in Japan, in Ogijima, which is a very little island in the inland sea of Japan. At the, and uh, it's the Seto, the Seto uh, Sea. And uh, this beautiful town, it was a fisher's town, uh, had the need of a welcoming place for visitors because it's a very beautiful island completely covered by narcissus, by flowers. And there's a lot of visitors and they need a, a place to, to welcome these people in the harbor. And I don't know, this was a miracle that somebody invited me to do that project because it was a dream. I remember with Rock or with Bob Wislow, we talked many times that one day I have to do a building. Well, and finally it is. And, uh, and finally the idea, it's uh, a roof 
made out with leathers. That is the, the ship arriving to the harbor. And with the reflection in the water, because it's also covered with water, that is from the shrine in the top of the hill. You see the reflection is making a new shape in the bottom. You see it's a, di a double shape, like a selfish, like an oyster. Like a, with, uh, and it's protecting the people inside. Everything is glass, it's completely transparent. And this kind of roof just floating on top. And uh, you see the shadows projecting down. I guess it's coming from my experience with Nomad and these kind of pieces that people could walk through. And, uh, and the mix of alphabets is also very similar. Uh, or, or the same experience that I did with this kind of work, like those, those heads that probably you remember, it was displayed in Chicago a couple of years ago. That is in Chicago. And uh, I'm doing a project in Calgary, which is a similar head, but, but people could walk inside as well. Uh, the experience with portraits allow me also to go back to a more traditional materials like alabaster. And, and I'm doing these groups of portraits. You see that will be also at Nasher Sculpture Center, end of January. I'm carving portraits of girls mainly, nine, ten years old. Well, I've always been convinced that girls uh, are the future. Uh, men are just an accident. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, those girls are composing all, all, all this kind of, you see, also girls. Uh, uh, one is from uh, Santo Domingo, the other one is from Spain, and the other one is from China. And uh, that was my show last September, October in New York. And, uh, and those heads has this kind of inscriptions in the face. In that case, it's hunger, disease, and insomnia which was, I'm sorry, uh, it was uh, the three main concepts that Oscar Wilde was talking in the prison of Reading when he said the main problem in prison is hunger, disease, insomnia. But if you expand a little bit more that concept, probably is the, the main things in life, and uh, especially for our body. And, and, and this kind of idea of three are repeating uh, with other concepts in all those faces. And, uh, and that was my, like, uh, my, my last public commission in nearby Liverpool, in St. Helens. And uh, it was a quite uh, great experience. It was an old uh, mine, a colliery, that uh, when 20 years ago was cancelled by Margaret Thatcher, uh, all, the, all this area was completely uh, unemployment, uh, problems, uh, depression, etc. And 20 years later, they, they are a completely new life, and they decided to transform that place into a public park. Okay, and three years ago, they asked me my collaboration to do a piece to try to regenerate that area, to try to bring life again in. And uh, I took one of my little girls, and I just uh, did the piece, it's about 22 meters tall, uh, that you can see from the distance, uh, just appearing behind the trees like a dream. The title is Dream. I remember one of the ex-miners one day uh, told me, well, Jauma, you, you cannot imagine how hard it is to work in the pit when you are 300 meters below and it's completely darkness. And la light becomes a dream. He said, and uh, I, I really like it because I never thought that light would be a problem because I'm from the Mediterranean area and, and it seems that the light is so, something so normal. But, uh, and that piece, even if it's made out with uh, marble dust and concrete and uh, white pigment, it's, uh, it's an homage to the light. And, uh, and I guess that the title Dream was quite appropriate. Uh, the cars that you, you see, it's because the piece is nearby the motorway which is connecting Manchester and Liverpool, the M62. And it's also very interesting when you are driving uh, that motorway that you can see the piece over there and it seems a completely impossible, it's a completely real piece. Uh, it seems only Photoshop, you know, and, uh, but it's true, it's true, it is. And, uh, they did a beautiful opening, 
and uh, because uh, many times the capacity of public art it's to return the sense of to be proud of one place to people and I guess that was a little bit experience in that case uh, uh, was a completely different case like Chicago because Chicago has an amazing background but a place like St. Helens it's a, it was a very the press area in the north of England they really get so proud and, and I'm deeply happy because that piece got the March war that uh, I'm going next Monday in London to, to get the, the war as the best uh, uh, public commission in England this year and uh, I'm sure half uh, part of the village will be with me in London that day because they really follow my project with the similar intensity that we did in Chicago uh, the, the, many times, the, the question in the public space is what, what they have to do, what to do. Because every place is so different that you could not give the same answer everywhere. You cannot reproduce as, as a system the same sign. Every place needs really a different answer. Uh, that is probably uh, the reason that I, I, I'm so happy working in the public space because I, I like very much to, to talk with people and, and to try to imagine uh, what they are expecting to have and, uh, and to try to combine their needs with my needs because obviously uh, it's my work and I have to be myself always. But how to be yourself between the others? I guess that it's again this empty space in between a conversation. And, uh, and I guess uh, public space, it's a terrific place to develop art and concepts, completely different like architects are doing, because we are not uh, architects, we are artists. And I guess we can introduce in the, in the, in the public space something that I love to say, soul, uh, just a breath of life, a certain poetry. And before to start that lecture talking with Ms. Sick, uh, I, I told her that uh, the best beautiful gift that I, I got it was when we unveiled the Crown Fountain and everybody starts to smile. Today, in a very complex world, just to, to, to see people smiling is really something. It's not easy to make people smile. And, uh, and that for me was an amazing gift. Uh, and every project is a different experience. I suppose in my next project, uh, I will interact with the space in a different way because I have in my background all this long process but uh, every time it's, it's like when you fall in love that you don't know what to do and uh, it seems that you are inventing love and, and nobody, not one single lover can uh, realize that before him was millions of people falling in love before when, when, when it's you, it's your problem and that is a more exciting part in public art. It's when somebody asks you a question. And um, many times the same question has the answer. But you have to listen. You have to open your mind to listen and everything is working perfectly well. Thank you very much. I remember uh, when we, we developed the project with uh, US equities and, and all, all the teams, uh, uh, our concern was security. But when I'm deciding to do a piece, the, the, the main concept is to dream with. And, uh, and I guess the Crown Fountain is a, is, a, is a piece to dream. I don't know if you like the project. Oh, love you love it? OK. And, uh, but it, it was a very risky project. I mean, because a piece like that has not the maintenance that a piece like the Crown Fountain needs to have. 
but uh, I, I don't know what to say about your question. I mean, it's, it's working. <laughs> Could, do you have a microphone? Because I cannot hear the hell. Do you have another microphone? Ah. No, mother and... Uh, Yes. No, I, I love the piece, but my, I just thought when I saw the wide expanse with water and people walking in it, I thought that this, somebody would probably sue and the lawyers would say, turn the water off and get the people out of there. But that never happened, I guess. But thanks God. <laughs> but uh, I had a funny experience and uh, I, had, uh, I got a commission, I don't say where because it's a little bit embarrassing, but uh, in the States. And I remember uh, everything was right, everybody was happy, but suddenly uh, when they was doing the contract, lawyers recommend them, don't do it, because it was dangerous. And I keep that document in my studio because it's really strange, because it says it's too beautiful to be sure. And, uh, and I, I didn't, the project, uh, it was cancelled completely. But the, the, the concept was very strange. It, it is too beautiful to be sure. And, uh, well, maybe that is art, no? I mean, you have to risk, but I don't know. I lost the project in that case. It's a very healthy lecture for you. <laughs> We're enjoying that very much. The Crown Fountain is interesting because it required quite a lot of technical design as well as your artistic concept. And I was wondering, what was it like working with the engineers in order to, at the same time, preserve your concept and yet make the thing work the way it was supposed to? Well, that, that speaks very well about the quality of the team because I guess, uh, since the, all the people who was taking care about the body, Rob Frankel, Alan Shadman, uh, Mark Sexton, Bob Wieslow, etc., all, all these people, engineers, the Crystal Fountain, etc., also the people who was taking care about the soul, John Manning, Alan Shadman, and the people from the school of the Art Institute, they, they really uh, were very concerned about to, to respect the original design. And uh, I have to say that the, the Crown family was also quite key in that moment because they really defend and protect me, my, my ideas very well. You know, I'm normally an artist are working more or less alone. And for me, it was really a huge project in the way that we need a lot of teams around. And, but I guess it was uh, the capacity of Rob Frankel and Mark Sexton really to control all this chaos. But uh, uh, for me, it was a terrific experience in the way that uh, now I, 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 I learn a lot also about that way, you know, like a conductor with an orchestra, you have I don't know how many musicians, and uh, you have to more or less to help them to go to the right direction. What was your biggest surprise in that process? Well, uh, my biggest surprise was uh, finally to finish the piece because was not sure, every day wasn't sure. And the second was the response of people. I guess that was really the best, uh, for not only for me, but for all our, the team and the family crown. Believe me that, uh, I don't know if you follow more or less the process of that project. In the beginning, a lot of people in the city was a little bit against because they misunderstood the project. Then. Uh, it was a lot of complications about techniques because we had to invent even something in between because to mix water and electricity and things like that and LED images or compute, well, it was really uh, conceptually complex, but visually is very simple, looks very simple because it's just horizontal and vertical as, as always, but uh, it was complex. But uh, I guess everybody was really happy because it was a very intense process during those 40, 40 years working. 
and when the response of kids, that was my surprise, because I remember that a lot of people said, well, I don't know, it probably it will be a too intellectual project, nobody will understand. And finally, I also thought the same, maybe I said, maybe it's too intellectual. And, and it's funny because thanks to the kids, uh, I guess it's my uh, more physical project, because really people could interact in a, more, a very physical way. And, uh, and, and thanks to the team, they could walk wherever that is very sure. It's, it's nothing in danger. If your kids are walking, I don't know, far of you, it's not in danger. And, and that was one of the goals in that project, because they could really interact with the piece without any potential problem. With all your travels, um, how do you find time for studio? to work in the studio? Uh, uh. Well, that is a good question, but uh, I always thought that my studio is my brain, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and my, my physical studio is an ampliation of my brain, like a computer is uh, an ampliation of your brain, uh, your notebook, etc. Uh, but I guess the brain is the right place to be. And, uh, and uh, of course, uh, well, I, I grew up in, in function of my uh, wishes. Uh, I, lo I love to travel. And I said many times, I prefer to do a trip than to do an extra drawing. I prefer to renounce to do two drawings, only to do one, but to do the trip. And uh, because I guess it's a source of information, uh, fantastic. Well, uh, I, I, I love to meet people everywhere. and. Uh, and many times, artists, we have the, the, the risk to, to produce too much. In my case, it's good because I travel probably too much, but not produce too much. I want to know about more about the process of making this piece, you know, how long it took you to make it, and what kind of process. Is it like structure and hollowed and casting involved? Thank you. Yeah, it's... Uh, uh, that piece, uh, I, I, I took the portrait of that girl, uh, and then uh, I elongate as I did in the Crown Fountain. It's, uh, I did the same proportion like in the Crown Fountain, which is about one third more approximately in the faces, to try to catch this kind of spiritual life inside ourselves. You know? When you take a little bit this elongated uh, idea, it gives more the sense of flame coming out from the earth. Okay, then we, we did the, the molds uh, in polyesterine, and then we cast with a mix of concrete, Spanish dolomite, which is uh, crushed marble, very white, which select a very white marble dust, and uh, white pigment. They did a kind of mix, and they cast, uh, you see, it's cast in sections. You can see, like the crown fountain, the glass blocks, but a little bit bigger, no? obviously. And uh, I'm not remember exactly, but I guess it's about 57 elements uh, composing the piece. It's, uh, I have a, a beautiful sequence of the, all the construction of the piece. And uh, with cranes, they start with the bottom, pam, pam, one after another. And it's hollow, obviously. But even like that, uh, the piece, I guess, it was over 450 tons weight. Uh, and, uh, and they spent several months casting every single part and carrying from... The, the piece was made in a, in, a, in a British company called Evans. That uh, it's... Uh, uh, well, I don't remember only the name of the airport, East Midlands. But nearby, Nottingham, Nottingham. And then they carried the piece by trucks to, to St. Helens, nearby Liverpool, in sections. They were casting and installing, more or less, and they took several months to do that. And the piece is prepared to have a, a light beam as well. Uh, the, the top of the head, it's, it has a, a hole with a glass, but today I prefer don't talk about negative things, because art in public space is plenty of negative things. But uh, when everything was ready, the authorities of the, 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 
the motorway authorities, the highway authorities, uh, refused to give me the permission to illuminate the piece in the evening because they said it could disturb the, dr the, the, the drivers, which is ridiculous. But And uh, everything is prepared to be illuminated in the evening with the light beam also, which is coming out from the head, connecting the, the, this uh, portrait with the, with the sky, which was the idea of dream, the idea to connect with your dreams. But uh, it's, I have not the permission yet. We are fighting still with, but it's, uh, it, everything is ready to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, no, with the styroform. Yeah. A styroform, sorry, my English is horrible. A styroform. Okay. Hope you all. Thanks so much for the talk.